Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for our children, no matter what age they are. Thank you for the life that you give them and the life they bring us. Help us to celebrate the life you bring us and stay close to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Sometimes I'm honest with myself. Some of the time that that happens is because I've been willing to think differently about me. Other times, to be honest, it's because I've been pushed to think differently. I like thinking that I'm right. I like having my worldview be solid, unchanging, and unthreatened. Changing what I think about myself is uncomfortable. Have you ever caused sadness in someone you care about because you were unwilling to be honest with yourself? I imagine that's true for most of you. It's true for me. You would think that having gone through seeing how we have hurt someone else would change us enough to be open to being humbler in the future. But we tend to forget, don't we? It's difficult to change. The Apostle Paul was probably answering a question that was given to him by a church in the Greek city of Corinth. Dear Paul, we have a situation. What do we do about eating meat that's been offered to idols? Now, it has always been true that the problem is often not what the problem is. Paul's answer to the church's question goes deeper than the details that were presented to him. He writes to them about the real problem. They needed to see themselves. They needed to see God. There were all sorts of people in the church of Corinth. And this is true today as well. There are all sorts of folks in our church and in every church. Some of those people in Paul's church were converted from the worship of what we would call other gods, small g, or false idols. There were probably also some members of the church who had been converted from Judaism. And the Jewish converts were probably still particular about how meat was prepared. It needed to be kosher. The Gentile or Greek converts remembered that they had offered meat to their other gods and, and did not want to participate in that now that they followed Jesus. Other members of the church, probably from both of those parties, knew that there really aren't any other gods, so it didn't matter where the meat came from as long as it was good. They had knowledge. Think about the potlucks at that church. Ralph, how can you eat that? You know where it came from. God would be displeased. Ralph, how can you not eat that? Your theology is bad and your God is way too small. Go ahead and eat. Who brought that crock pot? Some of the comments would not be out loud. I think that the stranger the Bible story is, the more likely it is that it has something very important to tell us. See, we don't worry about meat offered to idols. I've never met anyone who refused to eat something just because it was kosher. My favorite corned beef is kosher. <laughs> and you can't get it here. This strange story has no connection to our everyday life. Well, Paul's answer to the question makes this a passage for all time. Paul would not have been a fan of Patrick Henry. He's the one who said, give me liberty or give me death. He probably would not have been on board with the New Hampshire motto, live free or die. For Paul, freedom was only found in one place, and that's in Jesus Christ. After acknowledging how difficult the situation was for those who think it's wrong to eat the meat offered to idols, Paul says this to the church, but take care that this liberty of yours 
does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. You've heard me quote Sister Hillary several times now. It seems like a lifetime ago that in one of our Lenten studies last year, she said those words that haunt me. She was talking with me about how food is prepared at the monastery where she lives with several others. They take turns doing the cooking. And I asked her if all of them cooked really well. And like life goes, some are better than others. And some have preferences. What do you do, I asked. Because I would be scheming for the best meal every time. Her response was, sometimes you don't get to say anything. Take care that this liberty of yours does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Our preferences take second place to love. It's not enough to know things. Paul was aware that some folks have knowledge about what is true in this world. Some are very educated and know things. It's not enough to know things. If we know things, we want to educate everybody else, don't we? Isn't educating others the real way to love them? So therefore, I have the freedom to say whatever I want on Facebook. Take care, Ralph. It's not about my wisdom or wit. Paul told the church members of Corinth, Corinth that if they wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. It's like the Bible says to treat every interaction we have with another person as if we were interacting with Jesus himself. If in my freedom I hurt Deacon Lisa, I sin against Christ. Store clerks, other drivers, politicians, media personalities, all the others are Jesus for us. I think this strange passage about meat preparation speaks loudly to our church and society today. There are a lot of words and actions that are presented without consideration of our brothers and sisters. Here is what Paul decided for himself and offered to the church as a way of life. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Paul didn't want his behavior, his freedom, to encourage others to act in ways against their conscience. He didn't want to foster their sin. He chose love over his freedom to do whatever he pleased. His freedom was in Jesus. And he would tell us that that's the only true freedom. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat. This might be the time in the sermon to tune me out. I want you to ponder what other words you, we, could put in place of food in that sentence. Therefore, if blank is the cause of their falling, I will never blank. I warned you. If my political opinions are the cause, if my views of the virus or masks are the cause, if my beliefs are the cause, are just a few of the possibilities to put in that blank. Now, Paul is not encouraging us to not have opinions and knowledge. He's definitely not discouraging conversations and learning. He is, however, getting us to point blank look at how we treat each other. He's encouraging us to let our love for each other lead the way. Don't let your knowledge lead the way. Let love lead the way. You may decide that sometimes you don't get to say something. 
we have the freedom to surrender our freedom and have true freedom in Christ. Amen. We invite your participation, comments yes, or questions. Uh, someone right off the bat uh, tagged the thing that I had said uh, in the first sermon, um, just thanking you for, for your, your comment on our preferences take second place to love. Um, the summary of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So love is always the way, always first, rather than our preferences, our freedom, um, because as you said, or no, I, I, you didn't say this. I've heard you quote it, but uh, it's our presiding bishop uh, says, if it's not about love, mm -hmm. then it's not about God. That's the worst Michael Curry impression you'll it ever really hear. It really is. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> really, really bad. Yeah. So I won't tell on you. Yeah. No, thanks. <laughs> In contrast to that, I want to mention a comment that we missed at the eight o'clock service. Mm. And if I get it right, it's, it's, is it? When is it okay not to? When is it okay? When do you have to say something? Was that? When, when is it okay not to share knowledge? When is it okay not to share knowledge? I think that's the one you're thinking of. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we, we feel a lot of pressure to say something most of the time, and I don't have the answer to that, but I wonder about there being times in the history of the church where certain things become more important than other things. Mm. And I have not met anybody in a long time that doesn't know the positions church on something. They even know the positions of different denominations yep. on these issues. And it's like, well, I need to tell them again because now I know it. I think the time of the church now more, not completely, but more is it's time to not say things, which is really saying something. Yeah. And if you went back 50 years or 100 years, we, I know I would, probably be very, very surprised at, wait, they're not talking about all the things that we're talking about today, or that denomination doesn't think about or talk about that issue in the same way that they're talking about it now. They're so angry today, why weren't they angry about the very same thing 50, 100 years ago, even sometimes eight years ago? Um, right. we, we, how quickly we get addicted to outrage, as we've talked about in the past. Um, but yeah. Better this time? Yeah, I mean, a little, a little bit got through. I, I shared... <laughs> I shared at the 8 o'clock service that I would be praying that something would get through at the 10 o'clock service because I haven't almost, I realized it's almost a visceral response to this passage because mm -hmm. in the past and past churches I've belonged to when I hear this passage, it's always in the context of how women should behave, how women should dress, and how women should make sure that you don't lead men astray. And so regardless of any additional words, that's the narrative that's going on in my mind. Yeah. And a little bit got through, so like, that's, that's good. And you took I took notes? I did. What, that's so cool. I know, right? And the funny thing is, I think it might be the thing that jumped out at you at the eight o'clock service that I was like, yeah, I don't think Father Ralph said that. <laughs> um, freedom found in one place, freedom is found in one place and then it's in Jesus Christ. I think that's the one that you keyed in on. No, it wasn't. But, no, but yeah. you can pretend it was. Okay, it okay, was. Okay, cool. And See how we help each other in conversation? <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a lie. It's yeah. not. That's, I mean, I heard that, but that's not what I talked about at 8 no. o'clock either. So, yeah. Well, that's what I heard you There say. you go. See? That, then that's clearly what I talked about. We're, we're helping Deacon Lisa in the, in the conversation. There you go. So, like, the, the takeaway that I had from that then, if that's true, then Jesus is bigger than the baggage that I bring. Jesus is bigger than the way that Bible and other words have been used against me. Jesus is bigger than the words that I've used against other people. Mm. Mm. And so that's what got through at this service.
Is it didn't all deflect off. <laughs> is Jesus bigger than the Bible? Well, I, I distinctly remember Jesus saying, you, you look at the Bible and you want to worship that, but these are the words that testify about me, he, Jesus says. So do not hold up the scriptures as the thing to be worshiped because that's not the point of the, of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Th those words were not written to be worshiped or to be held up so lofty as to say they are higher than God. Um, they point, they point mm -hmm. to God, they point to Jesus. So mm -hmm. some, someone asked the question, what if what we say might hurt some, but help others? Hmm. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? Those are things that I don't include in a sermon. Hmm. Right? Because then if I know that's going to happen, then I'm thinking sermon might not be the place to do that. Yeah. And so maybe I have to take more time, more effort, to get you alone. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to tell you all those nice things about you. <laughs> to tell me all the things that I need to hear. Yeah. You know, because, I, well, because there are things that, oh my gosh, I see my friend who is in trouble, who is in danger. I, I, I want to help. I, I don't want to, you know, just sort of watch them destroy themselves. But yeah, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call out Deacon Lisa in the middle of the sermon because of her bad behavior. That would mm -hmm. be the absolute wrong way to use, a, use that format. Um, but coffee, listening, building our relationship, that's where, that's where I go uh, with that. If I knew that, that Father Aaron on snowy days would run behind moving cars and grab their bumpers and slide behind the car, I would probably warn him, but <laughs> not Deacon Lisa. But there you are did, probably you... some situations where this is harder right. and, mm -hmm. and you're having to sort out really then is now the time to say something. There's a, there's a comment as well. Lisa, I heard it too, sit down and shut up. Should we be silent when someone is injured or women can't vote or blacks can't sleep in Appleton? Mm. Yep, and I think that there are times to say something, but again, it's, it's the, I'll go with the word preference, okay? How do I prefer people and, and then how do I have a conversation with you then about how we prefer people and how we maybe have been not doing well with this passage from the Apostle Paul and, and our knowledge has puffed us up. How do we pause and rethink how we treat people? Well, and also it, there's, I think there's a difference between me saying something to a friend of mine about their behavior versus stepping back and saying something to all of society about systemic racism or, or homelessness or, or something like that. Th those, are, those are two different ways to say something. What I might say to all of society, for anyone who's listening to me, yeah, that might hurt some people because some people might disagree with me or might, but, and yet I think there are some things where we do need to raise our hand and say, wait a minute, this is wrong. This cannot continue. This should not be. And there'll be some people that will disagree with that. Yep. And they might get hurt. Well, I believe that is wrong. Not, right. you're wrong to not mm -hmm. believe what I sure. believe. Sure. I believe that's wrong. I believe people of color should be able to sleep in Appleton. Right? You might not Amen. believe that, but I believe that. And that's part of my faith. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not telling you you're bad or wrong by saying it that way. I might believe you're bad or wrong, but <laughs> I'm not saying it. I'm saying this is my testimony about my relationship with Christ. That what I believe about God, and I take this from the prayer of humble access that people have mixed reactions to because it points out our sinfulness, but it's in that phrase about God whose property is always to have mercy. Mm. And how do I speak of mercy? about God's preference for me, for you, and for them. I don't believe it's offensive to say God prefers them because them's really us. That takes relationship. True. Well, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Amen.